I want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Kleeman. I'm the director at the Olson Library. I'm really, really pleased that so many of you are here, but kind of upset that you're here too, because this is an indication, I think, that some of these scams and frauds are on the rise. Um, but luckily, we have with us an expert, so I want to introduce to you Jeff Kirsten, <laughs> who I always have to, you have a long title. He's an agency liaison for the Bureau of Consumer Protection, which is then part of the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. So this is the consumer protection guy from the state. He knows lots. He's been at this for more than a decade. He travels around and does education for folks like us businesses, law enforcement, um, so he really is very knowledgeable and has spoken to lots of people in his career about these types of topics. Um, so thank you so much for ending your triumphant Northwoods tour yes. with us. He's been to... This is presentation six of six. Yes, exactly. He's been all over the Northwoods <laughs> talking about these topics. Um, before I hand it over to Jeff, I do just want to share with you, if you are ever in need of technology assistance, that is something that we offer here at the library. If you need just sort of a quick fix on something, stop on in any time. We do offer drop-in assistance, but if you have something that's a little bit more complex, we also have technology appointments that you can sign up for. Um, and those are free, you don't have to have a library card. Please stop by, we're happy to help as much as we can. Um, I just want to mention one other thing, and that's we're trying something new. We're trying to do some formal evaluation of our programs. So when we're done today, I do have some little survey slips in the back of the room. If you would fill out your feedback on today's uh, session, that would be really helpful to us in kind of planning what, what you care about, what you want to see in the future. So thank you so much, and I am going to turn it over to Jeff. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for joining me today, and I think we have some people joining us virtually, or is it just We're recording? We're going to do a recording and share that. A recording and share that. So, in the future, you'll <laughs> say hi to you as well. So, yes, my name is Jeff. I'm with the uh, State of Wisconsin Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, a little background about myself. I was a police officer for 13 years, so certainly during that career, I saw people trying to steal from others, and really that's what this is, these scams and frauds. And, criminals trying to steal our money, steal our personal information. Um, I also was an investigator for the state for about a year before taking this position. So I've seen how we at the state kind of fit into this equation of, of uh, helping a victim require, uh, recover from this. So if someone gets scammed and they lose money, we want to report that to law enforcement. This is criminal activity. They go after the bad guys. I'm no longer a police officer, they took my handcuffs away, I don't get to go after the bad guys anymore. What we do is we try to help the victim get the money back. So we help the victim recover financially while law enforcement goes after the bad guys, it's a nice two-pronged approach. <clears throat> we urge victims to report to us. Uh, these are numbers here at the federal government, uh, 5.4 million reports of scams last year. Probably more concerning at the bottom of this slide is $10 billion lost, billion with a B. Unfortunately, there's another stat out there that says only 1 in 11 victims comes forward. You know, we certainly understand somebody could be embarrassed or ashamed and they don't want to admit to family or friends or maybe even themselves that they got scammed. We urge those victims come forward and report it to us. Give us a chance to get that money back. Even if we can't, I still think there's value in reporting to us. We report up to the federal government. This number behind me can be more accurate. We learn what scams are working, what new twists on those scams are working, that might help out somebody else in the future not fall victim to that same scam. I'm going to share some stories with you this afternoon. Uh, victims have given me permission to share their stories because they don't want to see somebody else fall victim to that same scam. That's what we're trying to do. I, I, I want to help you avoid scams today. I can't cover all of them. We would be here for a week, right? There's so many. But what I'm going to try to give you today are some red flags to look out for. And when you see these red flags, I hope that just trigger something in you that end that communication, hang up that phone, don't respond to that text or email, and just stop and, and, and not lose any money. Um, this is one of those red flags to look out for, is how the criminals want to get your hand, their hands on your money. Uh, has anybody been told to kind of watch out for gift cards or don't go buy gift cards? So, so, I mean, there's nothing wrong with gift cards if you want to go and buy them and give them as a gift. That's what they're for. Send them out from the holiday cards, the Christmas cards, the birthday cards. That's great. If you're the recipient of those gift cards, great. Go use them. But 
But I can't stress this enough. If someone else is talking you into going and buying a gift card, that is a scam. That person is, to me, it sounds like they're trying to steal your money. The only reason you should go buy one is because you want to give one to somebody else as a gift. Now, why do the criminals go through this extra step? Why wouldn't they just take your, your debit or credit card numbers over the phone? Why do they get you to go buy a gift card? Any Not ideas? Not traceable. Not, not traceable. Yep, so it's very difficult for us at the state to trace them or law enforcement. We can both send subpoenas and there's not much to track. You know, these prepaid gift cards, they look like credit cards, you know, a little Visa MasterCard symbol, 16 digit account number, CVV code on the back, expiration date, but there's no name on that card. There's no account history. All we usually hear back is, is about one transaction where that money was transferred off that card to another gift card. Well, now we just learned about that next gift card, so now we got to start the whole subpoena process again. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. You kind of get the idea these criminals bounce this stuff down the line, and pretty soon that money just disappears. Now, some of these gift card companies have started to partner up with each other, if you will. They, they know their products are being used by scammers. And there are some more tools being made available where potentially those funds or that money can get frozen before the criminals are able to move it too far down the line. But it's imperative that that gets reported to us right away. It's not the only thing you need to look out for. Does anybody recognize that symbol at the top of the screen? Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency or specifically mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Does anybody know how to buy Bitcoin? Right here in town, in Eagle River, there are Bitcoin ETFs. I think there's two of them in town that I know of. Um, so, the victims are getting talked into going to the bank, pulling out money, driving to one of these machines, feeding money into that machine, and the victim just bought Bitcoin, even though the victim might not even know what that is. And because it's now so easy to buy Bitcoin, you don't have to have an account set up, you don't even have to know what it is. Again, victims are getting talked into doing this. And it's a preferred method of payment for the criminals, very much for the same reasons as gift cards. So the, 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 victim, the, the, the suspect gets the money you know, somewhere else in the world instantaneously. And there's very little for us at the state to track. I can't even send a subpoena to Bitcoin. There's no such thing as Bitcoin. There's no address, there's no corporate entity, there's no brick and mortar store, there's no registered agent. Don't get me wrong, Bitcoin is a real thing, but there's no way to send a subpoena. There's no company to reach out to. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Law enforcement does have some tools available to them where they can track the money on the blockchain. And they, there has been some success in sending subpoenas to the crypto exchanges and freezing those wallets. At least until the point where the criminal tries to cash out and then law enforcement might be able to figure out who that is. But again, that needs to be reported so law enforcement can go after that money. Yes. For, for those of us who have not studied what Bitcoin coin is, what is it? Yeah, sure. Is um, it a piece of gold? Or no, no, no it's, it's nothing that you can hold in your hand. It's, it's a digital token on your computer or on, a, on, a, on an electronic device. Um, it, it started about uh, 15 years ago, and um, you know, for whatever reason, it took off in popularity. Is it digital money? Yes, yes, that's a, I think, fair. It's, it's not regulated by the government. It's a, it's a thing of value that two people can transfer back and forth to each other from anywhere in the world. Like a necklace, like something like that. But uh, digital. Yeah, think about, think of it more like a, like a, like a, a credit on your, on your computer that I can transfer credits to you and you can transfer oh. credits back to me. Oh. And, oh, okay. and uh, just a, a, a digital thing that, that just has grown in popularity and grown in value. Back in 2009, 2010, they couldn't give them away. They were worth, you know, fractions of a penny. And I, I think it was a couple of years ago, it peaked at about a single Bitcoin was worth $70,000. So I talked to a gentleman in uh, Pewaukee, Wisconsin, that bought a single Bitcoin for $500, and he sold it later for $45,000. But I've also talked to people that have invested in it, and Money goes down, and they lost it. Yep. It's very volatile. So you know how, like, if, okay. think of it as like playing the stock market. Oh, you know, okay. things go up, things go down. Good luck trying to predict that. Well, cryptocurrency is even more volatile than that. Oh. So 
I'm not here to say crypto is a scam, that's not my place. Uh, there, I know people that will tell you that. The only reason I bring it up in a scam presentation is the criminals are, are confirmed in using it. Yeah, they, they like to use it because, because it's not regulated by the government and they get their hands on the money from anywhere in the world and it's very untraceable. Now, again, I'm not advising anybody on whether they should or should not get involved in Bitcoin, but very much like gift cards. If you want to buy it, and that's your decision, you want to go to the store and buy a gift card, you want to go down and buy some cryptocurrency, and you've done your research, and you want to get involved in it, well, that's your business. But if someone else is telling you to buy either one of those products, that is a scam. Stay away from that okay. if someone else is telling you, telling you to buy it. Again, not the only thing to watch out for. Yes, ma'am. If I'm sending somebody Bitcoin, do I need an account number? Do I need their email address? How do you? Yeah, it's, it's really not. Yeah. I mean, you, you would have to be in, you'd have to have a digital wallet set digital up. Digital wallet. Okay. And, well, it's kind of like a digital wallet, an, an account. Um, you know, like most of our accounts have a username and password. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly the same, but there's, <laughs> in essence, a username and a password and then you know you can, you can transfer this stuff around and it's all completely public that's the blockchain so you can see every single bitcoin that's out there you can see what digital wallets they're in and, and where everything is but you have no idea who belongs to those digital wallets that's the that's the anonymity of it but again something to look out for if someone else is telling you to buy into this uh, they certainly like to call us, right? Does everybody understand that um, they can manipulate your caller ID? They can make it say whatever they want. You can't trust caller ID. All of those manipulations are tricks to get you to answer the phone. If you look at it from their standpoint, step number one to get you to fall for a scam, got to get you to answer the phone. If you don't answer the phone, you can't fall victim, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm about to tell you, if you don't recognize the number, just don't answer and, and it. I know that's really simple for me to stand up here and say it. And if you're in a position in life where you can ignore unknown phone numbers, great. Do that. Let them go to voicemail. You can always check that later. But, I, I mean, I talk to business professionals and realtors and people that own their own business. And, you know, sometimes you have to answer, right? I mean, sometimes, you know, we're getting phone calls from who knows what number. And, and, and we don't want to miss those calls. If you answer your phone and it's a scam phone call, it's not the end of the world. Just as quickly as you can figure out that it's a scam, don't say anything, don't uh, talk to these individuals, don't push any buttons on your phone, just immediately hang up. The less you engage with these criminals, it seems like the less they call us. I'm not saying they give up, but it does seem like eventually you get less and less of these calls. The opposite is certainly true. If you engage with these folks, if you give them an inkling, that you're willing to talk to them. Well, they are just relentless. And they think it's just a matter of time before they call you up with the right particular scam pitch that day and they can get you to fall for something. Sometimes when we answer, there are the robocalls. You know, uh, it's two or three seconds of silence before a click and the message starts. I hang up before that click even happens. You know that's a computer generated call, there's nothing good about that, just let it go, just, just hang up and let it go to voicemail. Does anybody know if you're on the do not call list in Wisconsin? How, how good of a job does it do with scam phone calls? Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> oh, I'm just looking for punishment. So my agency is the that's our program. We we administer the do not call list. Oh. And, um, <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. You're, you're good. You're, you're good. So it, it's it's actually an incredibly well run program. Let me explain what it's for. It's for telemarketing. Telemarketing is where a real business wants to call you up as a Wisconsin consumer and try to sell you something. Businesses have to register with us and they're not allowed to call people. Huge financial penalties if they call people they're not allowed to call. And we go after those businesses, make sure that they're following the rules. What we're talking about are not businesses. These are criminals. And I mean, they're willing to steal your money. I'm here to tell you they're not intimidated by our do not call laws in Wisconsin. I mean, they're, they're, they're criminals. But I think there's value in being on the do not call list when it comes to scam phone calls. Here comes an incoming phone call. I don't recognize that number. Well, I know it's not a real business trying to call me up and sell me something because I'm on the do not call list. So by default, that number I don't recognize, it's probably just a scam. 
It makes it easier to ignore that unknown number. If you're not on the do not call list, well, trust me, you're going to get all the current scam, uh, scam phone calls you already get. But now on top of that, you're going to get all kinds of legitimate <laughs> phone calls. Good luck telling the difference. So um, if you want to get on that list, it's on page four of my book when, when we hand that up. Yes, ma'am? Do people have to re-register? Good question. Uh, the question was, uh, do people have to re-register? Um, back in the day, you used to, but no longer. It's, uh, years ago, the Wisconsin list merged with the federal list, and now once you're on it, you're on it. So on page four of the book, there is a website you can go to, plug in your phone numbers, and it'll tell you the, the date and year that you signed up. Oh. Or there's a phone number that you can call. You have to call from the number that you want to check or register. And then you can also just double check that everything is registered. A lot of people register their phone lines, but then they kind of forgot about their cell phones. And, and if they so change numbers, they have to do it again, Change right? numbers, yeah, you got to make sure. The only thing you can't register is a business line. Um, oh. that, that's not allowed to be on the do not call list. And then have you heard of this advice with uh, uh, you answer and they say, can, can you hear me okay? And before you know it, you just said, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Like, don't say yes, right? I think that's good advice, you know, we don't want somebody to have a recording of us saying yes, consenting to something. But it's so much more than that. Now we have AI, this artificial intelligence, and I think chat GPT 5.0 is coming out soon. It's just getting faster and faster, and criminals are using AI to save us. And one of the things they can do with it is they can steal your voice. It takes just three seconds of audio, according to the FBI. A computer can analyze that voice, and then a computer can use your voice to say every word in the English language. Oh. Uh, probably even different languages. But, uh, so it's so much more than just don't say yes. I mean, if they steal your voice, then maybe they call up your bank and they start asking questions about your account. And I see this, I'm, there's a potential this could backfire more in smaller towns. You know, I bet when you call your bank, your bankers know you. Yeah. You know your bankers. Yeah. We can no longer trust that. Um, so, bank. I, I do a lot of presentations for banks, and they have asked me, can you let your audiences know that please don't get frustrated with us when you call, and we have to ask you all those password questions or those security questions. Even if we recognize you, we still have to ask. That's a good thing. That's your bank trying to keep your money safe. Because you're just a phone call to them. They don't know who you are. Yes. And can I take on to that? I'm yeah. a retired banker, yep. and I would encourage everyone to please not get irritated with your banker if they do ask you questions about maybe some transactions that you've done or are asking to do, because uh, they're trained to protect you, yeah. and if they see you doing something unusual that's outside of your normal habits, they're going to ask you about large withdrawals you're making, anything unusual like that. And I know sometimes customers push back because they think it's rude and they think you're invading their privacy. But they're really doing it to protect you because bankers have seen far too many frauds and millions of dollars lost and locally. So, yeah, when somebody goes into a bank and they want to pull up five, ten thousand dollars in the bank, kind of, what you doing with that money? And they're not trying to get up in your business. They're trying to, they're trying, to pull, you. trying to feel this out to make sure this isn't a scam that they can help you put a stop to it. Um, you know, they're, like you said, they're trained to look out for that. They're trained to look for people coming in on the phones that look like they're visibly upset about something that's going on. And yep, the banks are in the business of keeping our money safe. They're on our side. But yes, AI, it's confirmed they're, they're doing that. So if you've been following along up to this point, you can't trust caller ID. You can't, when you're on the receiving end of a phone call, you can't trust the voice and what they're telling you over the phone because a criminal will just lie to you. And now I'm telling you, you can't even trust a phone call when you recognize the voice of a friend or a family member. That's 2024. And no, I'm not saying that every one of your phone calls with friends and family are, you know, fake AI calls and you should just hang up on everybody, unless you want to. Um, but all I can say is this, is that if the conversation all of a sudden turns towards your money, and we're starting talking about buying gift cards, or pulling money out of the bank, or sending money to somebody, or wiring money, as soon as we start talking about money, 
pump the brakes, you might not be talking to a friend or a family member. You could be talking to a criminal running a computer that's just trying to steal your money. Whenever it deals with your money, you got to verify this through multiple sources, not just a single incoming phone call. You make some phone calls back to know the numbers. You wait till you see people face to face. You gotta verify this to make sure it's real before you start sending your money somewhere or you might lose it to a criminal. They like to text us as well. I think the number one text right now is uh, we're trying to deliver your package, but we have incomplete address yes. information. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. That, one? that is the, uh, um, has taken over the Amazon message of somebody just charged $999 to your Amazon account. If it wasn't you, call this number to report fraud or yeah, click here. Yeah. Never trust those links or those phone numbers. Who knows where those messages come from? Your, your, your uh, package just shipped. Click here for tracking information. Oh, so you know, times. and you know, if you didn't order anything this week, well, it's easier to figure out that's fake. What if you just yeah. ordered something <laughs> on, on Monday? It's human nature to just go, oh, this must be that thing I ordered, and before you know it, you click on it. Avoid that temptation. If you're really looking for tracking info, go back to where you ordered that thing from, log into that account, go to your profile, go to your order history, that's where you find the real tracking information. If you take one of these shortcuts, you just potentially open up your phone or your laptop or computer to, to uh, vulnerabilities by clicking on bad links or trusting bad phone numbers. All right, some actual scams that you might see here. There's a lot of psychology these criminals use against us. Uh, we're all humans. In the, well, I read, <laughs> no robots the way I. Androids up here in Eagle River. Not yet, anyway. Maybe that day's coming. Yeah. But we're all humans in this room. And, and I think we're all more alike than sometimes we care to admit. We're more easily manipulated than we care to admit. And these, these criminals have been making these phone calls for 30 plus years. They, they know how to push our buttons. And one of their favorite tactics is to try to get you to panic about something or get scared or upset about a situation. And when you, they pretend to be from the government, it's easy to say scary things. Like, you owe back taxes, and they're going to pay right now over the phone, they're going to send the police to your house and arrest you. Or you're, you've reached your benefit, uh, Medicare benefit limit for the year, and if you don't do this thing, you know, you're going to run out of benefit. And your social security number is being suspended, or you have a warrant for your arrest. These are all just fake phone calls. Will, will the federal government ever call us? <laughs> no, they like to send you a letter in the mail if they have legitimate business with you. Um, has anybody ever tried to reach out to somebody at the federal government? <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm not picking on them. I mean, they're bombarded with phone calls. I, I recently talked to somebody that works for Social Security, um, I think at the Rhinelander office, so up in this area. And they told me that 60% of the phone calls that their office receives are people pretending to be Social Security recipients trying to change direct deposit information to a different bank account. More than half of the phone calls. So they're trying to sort through those and then also deal with the other 40%, which are legitimate people calling in with questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's a rough situation, right? I believe that when Social Security, if, when you're trying to reach out to somebody, uh, if you call the real office, they'll let you make an appointment for an agent to call you back. And when you do that, they will give you a PIN number over the phone. And then later, when that real agent calls you, they're able to read that PIN number to you over the phone. Now I know I'm connected with the right people. That's a good thing. Hopefully we see more and more businesses and government agencies uh, adopt policies like that. So, Because often we find ourselves on the phone and I don't know if you are who you say you are and you don't know if I am who I say I am and we both want to just hang up on each other. <laughs> and, but not all agencies have done that. I know some agencies, uh, um, Veterans Affairs I believe have told me that they're not allowed to talk to people on the phone until they know they have the right person. So they call people up, they call veterans up. And then they have to ask questions to make sure they have the right veteran on the line before they can talk. But the veteran, they're, you know, they're receiving a phone call. You don't know who that is. You can't necessarily trust that that's really somebody from the veteran's office. And you know, hopefully that type of stuff gets cleaned up. When in doubt, you can always just hang up the phone. Even on the government, just hang up. It's OK to hang up. The worst time to get one of these scam phone calls is when you're expecting. 
Uh, here's a story about uh, the getting a phone call or one of these phone calls at a, at a bad time. Uh, I talked to a lady that received a phone call from uh, the power company. I think in this area is it We Energies or We Energies is a popular one. Uh, you know that's what they put on your caller ID. And if you can answer, I'm sorry. WPS, We Energies, XL. They you know they all have the same scam. Yep, so they put the name of the power company on your caller ID. If you answer, of course, that's who they say they're with. And then they'll tell you, you're behind on your bill. Now your head's spinning a little bit. What happened to last month's payment? I thought that went through. And then they tell you, we've got a crew on the way to your house to turn your power off. I need you to pay right now over the phone. I might be able to stop them. That's a red flag. You have to urgent, take action now or something really bad is going to happen. That's not how real companies do business. But my victim just heard that. Yes. She walks over to the living room window and she looks outside. Guess what happens to be driving down her street? A power truck happens to be driving down her street. Just by pure chance at that moment. Put yourself in her shoes just for a second. Who wouldn't think you were talking to the real power company? Oh my goodness, they're here. They're going to turn my power off. And she panicked. And in that moment of panic, she made a bad decision and she paid $5,000 over the phone. Ooh. Now five thousand dollars. Talk about that for a second. I don't know what your power bills are, up here, but I'm guessing that doesn't sound right. I can tell you this: I've, I've talked to so many victims of scams, and there's no correlation between whatever the scam was and how much money was lost. Once these criminals have a victim on the hook, they're so good at figuring out how much money somebody has, and they're just limited by their imagination on ways to extract that. I, I don't know exactly what they told her. I'm guessing. Late fees, penalties, you're in bad standing, you need to prepay for the whole next year. I mean, you know, whatever they can do to just get the most money out of that victim. Again, you can always just hang up the phone, right? What if it was really the power company we just hung up on? We're their customer, not the other way around, right? But now let's be honest, if I just heard that last month's payment didn't go through, I want to get to the bottom of what's going on, right? Do, do I just hit redial? No. No, do I, do I, I don't call the number back and call their ID, right? Do I Google WPS and just take the first phone number that pops up on the screen? Yeah, don't do that either. Is there a way I can find a real phone number for WPS? On your bill. Or if, or if you don't get bills anymore, a lot of places have gone paperless, sign into your actual account, or you know, find that real account information. That's where you find the real phone number. You know, your bank statement has a bill on it. Every plastic card in your wallet has a number. Your bank statement has a phone, uh, did I say a bank statement has a bill on it? It has a phone number on it. Every plastic card in your wallet has a number on it. Always do that little extra bit of homework. Find that real phone number. Now, you'd be the one to reach back out to the business. Call them up. I mean, hey, I just got a phone call from you guys. Something wrong with my bill. What's going on? And then you'll probably find out, oh, no, that wasn't us. That's just a scam going around, and you were right to hang up. And it also puts your mind at ease that everything's fine. So, my name is Don Holmes. I live in Sun City West, Arizona. In this community, we're all seniors. After you move in here, even if you don't know anybody, you get to know other people you enjoy doing things with. I use a computer predominantly for email and to get the news. One day a thing pops up and kind of blocks the screen and says, You've got all kinds of uh, viruses in your computer. The design of the pop-up uh, had a Microsoft logo on the top, and they had a number. And I couldn't get rid of this, this thing on the screen. Turn the computer off, turn it back on, it's still there. So I called the number. They identified themselves as Microsoft. I had no feeling that there was any anything wrong. The tech support scams are real, and they're causing enormous consumer injury hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's just based on the FTC's own law enforcement work. Just like Mr. Holmes, a lot of people are getting pop-ups on their screens, and often they, they claim to be associated with a company such as Microsoft or Apple, giving them lots of credibility. They told me they would clear what they considered to be malware in there. In order to clear it up, they needed to get into my computer and have my control of the computer turned over to them. So I gave them my password. They went in, the thing came off of the screen. When I went back to my computer the next day, I couldn't access my files. You never let a stranger into your house. Don't let one into your computer. If you get a pop-up, don't click on a link. If you get a phone call from someone who says, 
your computer security is at risk, don't listen to them. Stop. Take the time to talk to a friend, talk to a family member. When this happened to me, I was a little bit embarrassed. I mean, I consider myself fairly alert, but I was targeted and I was scammed. I didn't really want to talk about this, but I realized that if I didn't talk about it, that if I didn't file the complaint with the Attorney General, that if I didn't file a complaint with the FTC, that, that I would have shrunk into myself. And by talking about it, by talking to all my friends, I began to realize that they also started talking and they started indicating that they had experienced similar things. That kind of community, that kind of exposure, it's not an embarrassment, it's just something that happens when you're a senior. You have to talk about to other seniors. What I would suggest is contact the FTC. They have a website. You can fill out a complaint online. We can be empowered with your family, your friends, and other people within your community to try to put a stop or at least protect ourselves from these kinds of scams. First of all, you don't have to go to the FTC. You can come back to us and, and bypass that stuff. But has anybody seen a pop-up window like that on your computer? This is really popular. It's a, uh, they might turn the volume up on your speakers and plays a loud noise and beep, beep, beep. Your computer is affected with a virus. Do not turn it off. Call this 1-800 number. If you turn your computer off, you will lose all of your data. They don't want you to turn your computer off. They want you to just call that number. And if you call that number, just like in the video, they'll pretend to be with Microsoft or Apple, and they're, they're very friendly, you know, they, they pretend to be the IT professional that's here to help you out. But they are just criminals trying to steal. And there's so many different ways this scam can go. First of all, if you ever see one of these pop-up windows on your computer, uh, sometimes control delete you can restart your computer. If that doesn't work, hold the power button down for 10 seconds, just do a hard reboot of your computer. But I've talked to victims that the power button has been disabled, they close the laptop, they, they, they can't get rid of these windows. If you have to, pull the battery out of the laptop, unplug it from the wall. I mean, it might not be the best for your operating system, but trust me, it's better than calling these numbers. Just yesterday in Mercer, uh, I heard from a gentleman whose nephew lives down in Illinois, and the nephew's neighbor, so somebody down in Illinois. Same thing, pop-up window, called the number, gave remote access to his computer. $90,000 gone from his retirement account. Wow. This is why it's so important that you tell you never tell your browsers to remember your passwords. So you know, like sometimes when you put your username and password in, like Chrome and Firefox and Edge, they will ask you, you just want to save this, save this information? Never say yes to that. Because then when you let somebody else into your computer, Certainly somebody else that knows what they're doing with computers, well, they know how to go to your favorites list, go to your, your bookmarks, and they find all these websites that you like to go to, and that's where the important ones are going to be, right? And then when they open up those web pages and they go to log into the accounts, you've already told the browser, just put the right username and password in, and they're able to log into your stuff. Um, that's one example of how this can go. Uh, I, I also talked to another victim that... Uh, she let these individuals into her computer. Now, it's, it's not usually like what the video says where he gave a password to somebody. It's usually much more sneaky than that. They'll just have you open up a web browser, type some numbers into an address bar, hit enter. You get a little warning window that you're going to give control to somebody else. They tell you just click yes to that. And before you know it, you're watching somebody else move that mouse pointer around on your screen. It's really that simple. And if you've ever seen someone else moving that mouse pointer around, that means someone's in your computer. And we're the administrators of our computers. They have access now to everything. If you've ever seen that and you don't personally know who that is, disconnect from the internet, get that computer to a trusted computer repair place, make sure that there's no uh, bad programs installed or, or uh, backdoor access that allows the criminals to come back whenever they want. So this victim I talked to, she gave access to the computer. She's on the phone with them, watching them do things on the computer screen, and they start showing her scary stuff. They have scary stuff lined up, ready to go to, oh my gosh, your computer's full of viruses, and the criminals are in your computer, and they're showing her all these files and screenshots of stuff. And then they tell her, oh no, you do online banking on your computer. 
the criminals are going to steal all your money. We need to get your money first and protect it before the criminals get to it. So they talk her into going down to the bank and pulling out all of her money. She thinks she's protecting it. $17,000. Of course, they keep her on the line and they tell her, you know, don't tell your bank what you're doing. Of course, your bank will tell you that your money is fine, but it's not. You know, the criminals are going to steal your money. We need to get to it first. So she goes and pulls out the $17,000. And then they direct her to drive down the road to a gas station. What do you think was inside that gas station? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yep, somebody said it. One of those Bitcoin ATMs. Okay, ma'am, what we're going to do is we're going to temporarily move your money into this other account. It's going to keep it safe until we can figure out what's going on with your computer. So she feeds $17,000 into this machine, <clears throat> prints off a receipt. Okay, ma'am, I just need that information from my records. I'll add that to your case file. So she reads it to him over the phone. Click, they hang up on her. They don't need her anymore, right? They've got her $17,000, and she's standing there inside of the gas station and, and just lost everything, and it all started with just a pop-up window on the computer, and it can happen just that fast. Wow. <laughs> I heard it just rains on real day out here. Is that, yeah. is that what's been going on? It's been lately. <laughs> <laughs> um, romance, relationships, sweetheart scams. This is the number one scam in the U.S. right now. I was recently doing this presentation down in uh, Prairie du Chien. That's about as far away from us as we can get right now, right? In the corner of the state. And I had a police lieutenant in the audience, and, and he stood up during this slide, and, and he addressed the room. There was about 35 of us, and he goes, obviously I can't give you names, but I can tell you right now there's about seven or eight people in town that are all sending money overseas to boyfriends and girlfriends, and we can't convince them to stop sending. Population 5,500 for Prairie du Chien, I mean, maybe a little bit bigger than Eagle River, but, you know, if that's happening in every small town, city, village, uh, across the state, across the nation, this is, this is very prevalent. Um, there are criminals out there that want to talk to you. You know, this isn't just online dating, but this is, you know, part of it is that, but you can't do anything online without there being a chat button. You play games online, you can chat with people. You, uh, you're on social media, you can chat with people. And like I said, these criminals, they want to talk to you, and they'll tell you everything you want to hear. They'll, they'll develop these friendships and these relationships with people so convincingly that the victim often doesn't even think it's a scam. What are you talking about? That's my friend. I've been talking to them online for a year. And then someday that person's going to start asking for money. Some red flags, somebody could be tied up in a romance scam. Uh, the other party has professed that they love you, and they've never met you face to face. They have all these excuses. They're in the military, they're serving overseas is a popular one, uh, they're a citizen of another country, there's visa issues right now, I can't visit. Uh, you're in Wisconsin, they're in Texas, California, Florida, it's too far to drive, gotta have some kind of surgery before I get on an airplane, opens up the door to start asking money for that fake surgery. You think this is, or the victim thinks this is, you know, a, a loved one or, or a friend, or you know, you're in some kind of relationship with this person, and then something bad happens in their life, and they start asking for a little bit of money. Usually not much in the beginning, but once they get the victim to pay one time, they've got that victim on the hook, and then it's just limited by their imagination to come up with new excuses and new excuses. Often their story is they have a lot of money available, or or. or have a lot of money, but it's tied up in a divorce or a lawsuit, and they just don't have access to it right now. They just dangle that carrot. You know, if you could just help me out, you know, then when that money comes through, I'll show up and sweep you off your feet. But of course, we know that's not going to happen. Long-term scam. So the first payment's not the end, and that's just the beginning for this one. Another long-term scam are the lottery scams, though. Uh, you want Publishers Clearinghouse, falls into this category. Has anybody received that phone call? Yes. That's a popular one, right? It's, uh, well, first of all, you can't win something you didn't play. <laughs> so foreign lotteries are illegal. You know, if you didn't enter a sweepstakes, you know you didn't win that stuff. If you had never have had anything to do with Publishers Clearinghouse your entire life, probably not calling you up to let you know you won something. But this isn't a scary phone call, right? This is exciting. Who isn't daydreaming what it would be like to win the lottery? You know, you want $5.8 million in your choice of three cars, and they're going to be here tomorrow with a film crew and a giant check and balloons, and it's happening. But then right before it happens, there's a little hiccup in the system, and there's the, some fees need to be paid. They might even send you a bad check to cover those fees. In a weird way, it doesn't even feel 
feel like you're paying out of pocket, but of course that check will bounce, so you are paying for it. Do people win stuff in life? Yeah. Sure, right? I mean, I've never done it, but I hear if you go to a casino and what is it, 1200 bucks? I think is the threshold. If you win more than 1200 uh, they just take my, you know, fill out the tax paperwork with me right on site. Great. Take my taxes on my winnings and just give me what's left over. If you're telling me I've got to pull my wallet out of my pocket to get to my winnings, that is a scam. Long-term scams, though, once they get that first payment, again, 100 bucks, 150 bucks doesn't seem like much when you think you've won millions. And it feels like it's right there. They're, gonna, they're on the way. They're going to be here tomorrow. But that's just the beginning. And I think I have a, a fun little way to kind of show you how they manipulate us. So we have a decent, decent group here, right? About 20, 20 plus people. So everybody listening to me right now, raise your hand if you'd like to admit when you're wrong. I saw, I saw one or two. Right? Many times without admitting. Right? Right? Well, and there's a little bit of a difference between I will admit when I'm wrong or do you like to admit when I'm wrong. And so I worded it specifically for that reason, but um, we're all the same, right? Nobody really likes to admit that. Um, here's why I asked you that goofy question. Once the victim makes that first payment, now they come back with another excuse of why you may need to make payment number two. In order to not send in payment number two, the victim kind of has to look at themselves in the mirror, admit you were wrong, you got scammed, you lost a hundred bucks, and just stop and cut your losses. But that's hard to do. We then have to admit to ourselves we got scammed, or we were wrong, or we got fooled. None of us really kind of want to do that. Most of us don't. It's weird, but it's actually kind of easier to hold on to that sliver of hope that this next payment will clear everything up and you just buy into whatever lie they're selling you. But of course we know that's not going to happen. And then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And if it was hard for somebody to walk away when they'd only lost 100, 150 bucks, how does somebody walk away when they lost 1,000, 5,000, 10,000? They just get so financially invested in this and so emotionally invested. It just becomes harder and harder to walk away. I know of two couples in the state of Wisconsin that have been tied up in lottery scams for over five years each. Uh, it started off with a $150 payment for each one. And last I knew, uh, from law enforcement, one couple had lost eighty-eight thousand, and the other was one hundred and six thousand. They haven't; they still can't convince. Or last I knew, they couldn't convince the, the people to stop sending money. You know, they think it's real, and you're trying to get between me and my winnings, and you're going to be sorry when this money shows up, and you didn't believe in me, and I'm right, and this is not a scam, and everybody else is telling them it's a scam. So all I can say is this: that if you ever have or in a situation where friends and family and maybe even law enforcement or maybe even somebody like me in my position are coming to you and telling you to stop sending money to somebody, stop sending money. We're not trying to get between you and the winnings. We're not trying to get between you and a loved one. We're trying to stop somebody from being scammed. And you know, I just hope if I'm ever in that situation, that'll be good for me to snap out of it. Yes, ma'am. We got about half a dozen phone calls from somebody and I answered. Can we talk to the head of the household? We want to talk to your husband. I said, I am the head of the household. Sorry, I don't go for that. And anyway, um, I want to talk to your husband. Okay, fine. But he's not here right now. Fine. And I hung up. And about 20 minutes later, I got the same phone call. About three hours later, I got the same phone call. <coughs> about three or more hours later, I got another phone call. By this time, my husband is home. The final phone call was at 11 o'clock at night. And supposedly they were delivering some kind of European car to our house. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to have uh, some kind of uh, a fee, import fee, something or another. Well, I copied down all these phone numbers. And I called the police department the next morning, and they said, well, did you give them information, or did they actually give them anything? And I said, no, but these people are scamming, and they said, well, there's nothing we can do. Who do you call? Yeah, see, call? that's the question I have. Yeah, I yeah, I, I, I feel your pain. It's, it's, it's challenging, because the numbers that you copy down from caller ID, I almost guarantee that's not the real numbers that they're calling from. They never put their real phone numbers on your caller ID. That would Everyone make it too easy for law enforcement to track them down. 
for playing that game with me. And they were going to deliver this Mercedes. You know, we need so much money. And I said, drop it off. The title on their seat. And I'll send you the money. The Mercedes never drove up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, now, if they give you a number in like a voicemail message to call them back at, we're, we're interested in learning those phone numbers because that's the number that we know goes back oh, okay. to the criminals. But just the number that shows up on caller ID, there's not much we can look into. I, I can't control law enforcement either. I mean, all we can do is try to report it to them, give them a chance to look into it. You can also do the same thing with my agency. We look into it as well. Um, but I would also just caution you to be careful. Uh, um, that reminded me of a story. I watched a documentary not that long ago where an investigative journalist interviewed some people in another country that run these types of scams. So she's interviewing the criminals. And one of the criminals at the very end of the episode, this is how he closes the deal. He'll ship you a Mercedes car key. So you actually get a physical thing in the mail. The car key shows up. And then he, oh, this must be real, and then he gets people to send the money. Wow. They're, they're just, they're just fake keys, you know, it doesn't, there's no car, but it's coming later on. But, um, just because something shows up in the mail, you know, I'll wait till the whole car is there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is never going to happen. Yes? And is it correct that the longer that someone is on the phone with them, shows more engagement, and shows that they are more gullible? the phone calls because I know um, a lot of times and I know my elderly parents my dad was a retired Milwaukee police officer so he thought he knew and he would want to stay on the phone and toy with them yeah. he thought he was playing with them I was always trying to teach him from my training the longer they have you on the phone the more you're showing that you're engaging in it and they're selling your phone number on the back side to other criminals, so is that? Yeah, I've also I've also seen it backfire on people that like to play yeah, games. I, like I, I did it for an hour and a half to keep them away from other people. Yeah, I did it on the phone with a yeah. scammer, and I was supposed to say Steve Harvey in a car call. Yeah, I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I subscribe to the don't pull the hornet's nest. Oh, I that along. So time. I've seen that backfire on folks. They oh. know what number they just dialed. They know your phone number. They'll just set a computer up to call you every 15 seconds. But then you block it. No, because they'll just call you from different phone numbers. Oh, they I put see. different stuff on oh, your caller ID every 15 oh. seconds. Your phone rings. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, your phone never stops mm -hmm. ringing. So you're like, fine, I'll just go back to the phone store and get a new phone number. Well, basically all the phone numbers that are available at the phone store right now are all numbers people have gotten rid of because they're trying to scam <laughs> phone calls. So I, I don't subscribe to the play games with them, don't upset them, yeah. don't give them an inkling you're willing to talk to them. I, I get it, there's funny YouTube videos out there of people playing games and <laughs> police officers playing games with them on the phone, but I don't, I, I've seen that backfire yeah, for folks. So just, these are criminals, it's not worth your time. And 
I happen to have all granddaughters and one grandson who is a very tall, very deep voiced young man. And this had a very high voice <laughs> yet. And I knew he was. And I said, yeah, you're full of baloney and gone. But you know, yeah, those are both examples where it sounds like the criminals didn't really do their homework. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, with this particular scam, there's another version out there where the criminals do the homework. So, so picture this hypothetical situation. You, you have a 16-year-old granddaughter, and you might not be on social media, but she probably is. And, and, and you know, if, you're, if you don't have a granddaughter, just picture a niece or a nephew or whatever. You get the idea. We say grandparent scam, but this could be family number. And she just turned 16, and she posts a picture on Instagram of her standing next to her new car. And six months ago, there's a post where she wishes you a happy birthday. Well, she doesn't call you, you know, auntie or uncle or grandma or grandpa. She calls you that little nickname she has for you, or Nana or Papa or whatever it is. And she posted a video on TikTok. You know, she wants to be the next internet sensation, right? And she posts another post on Instagram of where she's going on vacation later this summer. You know, those four, three posts and a, and a video on TikTok don't seem like that big of a deal, right? But if a criminal sees that, puts that all together, they grab the voice from the video, they call you up, they use the voice of your family member, they refer you to you as that special nickname, and Grandma, Grandma, I just got in a car accident with my new car, and uh, you know, I'm on vacation in Florida right now, and all of that makes sense. And you recognize the voice of your family member. You recognize the deep voice of your grandson because it's the real voice. I'm not joking about this. I mean, it, this voice stuff is so good with AI, it will fool the mother of her own child. There's documented cases of that. There's a mom that got a phone call from her 15-year-old daughter in Utah. She says, Mom, Mom, I really messed up. Mom, I'm in trouble. And then a male's voice comes on the line and says she's been kidnapped and they were asking for $1.5 million in ransom. Her daughter was fine. She was on a ski trip with friends. It was a computer she was talking to, it, and it was good enough to fool the child's mother. Wow. That was last April, a year ago April. That was back when AI wasn't even good, right? Wow. Now it's even better. So, so here's what I'm getting at. is like, this is tricky. Who just can hang up on that phone call when you recognize the voice of your own family member, and they use the right name, and they call you the right nickname, and, and they refer to real things that are going on right now? All I can say is this, if they start, as soon as they start talking about your money, you got to send somebody money, you got to verify this through multiple sources. You can't just trust the phone call. Uh, one, one tactic we have for you, it's low tech, but it seems to work, is ask for the family password. Have a family password set up with you and the immediate family members. If you ever get this call and just for a second you think it's real, what's the family password? You know what, even if you don't have a family password set up yet, what's the family password? If you're talking to a criminal, what's the next thing you're going to hear? Click. They don't know how to answer that. They, they, they know they can't get past that, so they're just going to go to their next victim. And, well, if you're talking to your real family member, let's hope that they remember the family password or click, they're going to hear you hanging up on them. Um, another tactic I've seen people do is as soon as they get this call, they immediately say, is that you, Jimmy? What does the criminal say? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Grandma and Grandpa, it's Jimmy. They don't have a grandchild named Jimmy. Like offer up a fake name right away at the beginning of the call, and if the voice at the other end latches onto that fake name, now you know this is fake. You can just feel good about hanging up on that call. Call the real parents, call the real family member back that's in distress. I mean, let's, let's look at it worst case scenario. If somebody really did get in a car crash, somebody is really in jail, they got arrested. Instantly sending money over the phone isn't going to help that situation. You have time to figure out if there's a real thing going on in your family that needs financial help, and you can verify that it's real days down the line. You don't ever have to make a decision right away. Um, investment scams, these are handled by the Wisconsin Department of Financial Institutions, but uh, there's a whole bunch of scams out there related to investments that they want to look at. Um, I, I know I went over on my time just a little bit. I've got like two slides left here for you. Uh, pig butchering is a, a, a term that's often used with some of the romance scams. Uh, two people will meet online, somebody will have a hot tip on investing in cryptocurrency and, and uh, they'll, they'll get the victim to open up a, a, a Coinbase or a Binance account and deposit a bunch of money that will get invested in, supposedly invested into crypto, and then they'll show the victim fake 
returns that looks like your money's growing and doubling and doubling and doubling and, and then they get the victim to put more money in, more money in. This is great, I'm making money and my investments are going up and up and up. That's, that's the fattening of the pig. And then the butchering of the pig is when the victim goes in to pull the money out to find out that the money was gone a long time ago, that somebody transferred out the original deposit to a different Bitcoin wallet and the money is gone. And all those other deposits are gone as well. Just report it to us uh, and we'll get it to the right state agency to look into it. Uh, charity scams. You get these phone calls, support the police, fire EMS. Guess who doesn't have to follow the do not call list? Charities. Charities. They're nonprofit. So whether you're on the do not call list or not, you're going to get real phone calls and fake phone calls. And there's no way to tell the difference. I also hear that we have like a big election leader this year. Is that, <laughs> guess who else is allowed to call you? Oh, no kidding. So you're going to get real phone calls from candidates and parties and fake phone calls from candidates and parties. And there's no way to tell the difference. So here's how I like to read numbers. Don't let someone call you up and tell you where your money should go. You decide where your money should go. If you want to support a candidate, a party, a charity, a uh, library, a senior center, the uh, police department, the fire, EMS, I bet you know where those folks are located. You reach out to them. At least then you know that's where your money is going. Um, Alright, how do we stop this stuff? Have you noticed your phones are getting better and better? It tells you when it's a scam phone call. Whenever you see that, just don't answer. You know it's a scam. Uh, whether you have an iPhone or an Android, there's a few extra things you can do. Some of the Android phones now have AI built into the phones that you can actually use AI now to screen your incoming phone calls. It's a positive story that I have for AI that it actually does a really good job of sorting out the scams and not even allowing them to come through to you. And uh, I'm sure Apple will have a version of that with the next iPhone that comes out. But right now on your iPhones and your Android phones, you can go into your phone setting and you can set your phone to block unknown callers. So unless it's a phone number you already have in your address book, you know, very likely just dump it right to voicemail. You can always check voicemail later. But at least your phones don't ring as much and you don't even get bothered with uh, yes? Where in settings are you going for that? Uh, you got an iPhone? Yep. Uh, go, so hit the gear, go to settings, scroll mm -hmm. down until you see phone. And that should be right there, toward the bottom of the screen. Got it? If not, I can help anybody with that at the end. Every, you got to get the right section. Yeah, the, the iPhones are all pretty much the same, but the Android phones can be a little bit, little bit different. Um, I work for the government, so I have both. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Lastly, I hope this doesn't happen to anybody. I hope you don't lose money to a scam. I hope your friends and family and loved ones don't lose money to scams. Um, but if it happens, come forward, report it to us. Give us a chance to look into it. Um, Try to get that money back, and we'll let law enforcement, uh, you know, pursue the bad guys. And to reach out to us, if you grab, uh, I don't know where that book's went, right here. If you grab a book from me, just flip it over to the back side, and there's all our contact information. I love to brag about my hotline staff. My hotline staff, uh, well, they close in 20 minutes, but if we call that number right now, uh, you only have to wait an average of 22 seconds before you get a real person at the state of Wisconsin. So, hey, we like to brag. We're the easiest state agency to reach out to. Well, now you can tell them that literally got a cheer in the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get to, I get to brag about them. So, uh, with that, I can open up to any questions, comments. Feel free to come on up and grab a book. Thank you very much. Thank you.